I'm basically just going to start by playing you guys a, a news video clip from Ottawa. All right, I'm going to play it and, and I'm just going to let you read this part. So basically there's a train station in Ottawa that smells bad and there's a big debate in their city council uh, about what to do. And this guy is basically saying, well, you know, I was there, I didn't smell anything. Uh, women smell better than men, and so uh, this is the exact words. I don't know if that's part of it. There was a little to do. The, the woman who had brought this to the attention of the city council thought he was being sexist, probably because of this wording. <laughs> I'm not sure what the issue is, or if in fact there is an issue, is how he put it. So, so basically, um, she asked for an apology. He refused to apologize. And then it became a, a big deal, so much so that I got called <laughs> to weigh in <laughs> on, on whether this is actually true. You can see they're leaving the meeting. She's being interviewed. She's saying, this is obviously sexist. He said, well, I feel no need to apologize. I think this is a scientific fact. Uh, this girl is saying, maybe I'm a really bad woman because I don't smell anything. And that guy's saying, it does smell a little off. And then we find out that there was a leak in one of the sewage pipes underneath. And they've now fixed it. But uh, what it came down to was um, you know, this discussion about whether or not women do truly smell better than men. And uh, the, the guy that was investigating this whole story, because it became such a big deal in Ottawa, called me. So I, I weighed in. And what I'm saying here is that, yes, it is actually true that women smell better than men. Probably if he had phrased it in a different way, something along the lines of, I, I have heard it's a scientific fact that women have better olfaction or sense of smell than men. So maybe I am not the best person to weigh in on this issue. <laughs> it would have been taken better. But it is true. It is true. And, and we have lots and lots of studies showing that, uh, that go back many, many years. This is probably the largest study that's ever been done. Uh, National Geographic sent out a smell survey in the 80s, and they got over 1.5 million responses. So this isn't just like asking, hey, do you smell this? Do you smell that? It's an actual scratch and sniff validated objective smell test that was sent back. And this huge amount of data is still being used for research today in this field because there's such a huge amount of data go to go through and that you can look at in different ways. So overall, it, it shows this, that you know men do have a slightly decreased acuity in smell. You can see it's not actually that different until you get to the 50s and 60s, at which time there is more precipitous fall off of olfactory sensitivity in men than in women, but we both decline with age. One of the more interesting studies that has been um, done with this data set from the National Geographic Smell Survey is this one. And I'm not sure if, you can, if that projects all the way to the back of the room, but what they did was they didn't just look at man versus woman or age. They put into this what the actual workplace environment was for each individual that was responding. And you can see actually very clearly that the people that scored best on these tests were women that were in the home. And the people that scored worst were the men that were working in factories. And we do know that there are a lot of uh, environmental toxins that do affect our ability to smell, and these are quite often present in industrial environments like factories. So that might add a little bit of information about why, in general, at the time in the 80s, um, there was a difference in what they were receiving back as responses. Now, definitely our workplaces are more progressive and more inclusive, but there is still a disparity in, in general in where women are working or, or found and what the smells are that they are familiar with. And what's also interesting about this is that when you look at the smell tests that we use, which are fairly rudimentary actually, they're basically just scratch and sniff booklets or pens that you put to the nose and smell and ask to identify or discriminate or what your threshold is for that, that smell. They, are, they tend to be smells that are found uh, sort of around the home, in the kitchen, and in the garden. Those are the most 
common things that we test for. And so that also may be playing a role here. And so, you know, when I look at that, I think, well, is this just a, you know, societal, you know, construct that, that we don't really smell better, but we're just testing better because of these things? No, <laughs> there is actually sex biologic differences and, and women do actually have a more acute sense of smell, even when you remove um, those types of things, because we have lots of other studies looking at specific hormones and how they affect our ability to smell. This study is an interesting one, um, just looking at sex differences in reproductive hormone influences on odor perception within women themselves. And if you can see, this is also an interesting labeling. There's an oral contraceptive column and then the normal <laughs> column. So maybe that would be better termed control. But, but so the control group, you can see that there's a sort of steady upshift in olfactory sensitivity until the woman hits ovulation and then it comes down again. Whereas the women in the oral contraceptive group are pretty low at their baseline continuously and there's a spike right at ovulation where they are, are coming off of the pill and having a period. So, um, so that's an interesting thing to, to notice. So this, this picture is a pretty hilarious picture. And it's also one of the most famous pictures because this is you know, back in the, the 60s when they started to really um, look at, is there a difference and how are we actually responding as men and women to smells, specifically smells of each other? And, and what does that mean? So, um, you know, they had a bunch of women go and smell the armpits of a bunch of guys. And the reason you're smelling the armpit is because that's, that has a lot of African glands and that's the most um, odor producing part of your body. And so if you're going to have body odor, it's going to be strongest in that area. Now, if you look at this type of study, you can see a lot of confounding factors, right? Physical attractiveness might affect how women respond to that smell. Whether or not the man smiled at them as they came up to sniff their armpit might affect the way they interpret the smell. And so there's a lot of confounding factors here. But now, even now to this day, there are constantly studies being done looking at how women and men respond to the sweat of the opposite sex. And it's done in a more controlled way. They take cotton, they put it in the armpit, they have someone work out, or they um, have someone sleep in a t-shirt for a whole week and then they have people smell that. So there are other ways, just taking something away from all these other factors about a person that, you, that might affect the way you think and just having the odor presented to the person. And when that happens, we actually um, find interesting things. For example, probably the reason that we choose our sexual partners and in fact choose our lifelong mates has much more to do with your sense of smell than maybe anything else that you think you're using to make those decisions. So I don't know if any of you guys remember the MHC, the Major Histocompatibility Complex. We have the ability to sense that in an odor. There are over like millions of different combinations of this. And what we sense is not a specific you know, type, but what we sense is how similar that MHC is to our own MHC or not. The MHC, Major Histocompatibility Complex, is basically part of the acquired immune system of how we distinguish self from foreign bodies or foreign substances in our, that enter our system. And interestingly, when you do one of these sweat tests that has been done and you give the sweat of different males to women to, to smell and describe, you know, are they attracted to that smell? They are much more attracted to smells that are different from their own major hispanic middle complex. And not only are they more attracted, but they identify that type of smell as being the type of smell that most of their boyfriends or husbands smell like. And so there is definitely a, a a sort of distinguishing between something that's genetically similar to us versus something that's genetically different than you. And, and that may be because evolutionarily speaking, it is better to not be breeding with someone who is very genetically similar to you, right? This pre prevents inbreeding basically in the species. This interestingly goes away in women who are on birth control pills. They no longer have a preference 
for MHC that's different than theirs, they have no preference based on that. And that, that study you know, brings about headlines like this, like the pill makes women pick bad mates, which we could have a whole hour long discussion about whether that is true or not true or lots of different things about it. But, um, but that's you know, what comes out of that. So what about the opposite um, factor? You know, how, how does this uh, occur when men are sw smelling the sweat of women? Do they also select out for MHC that's different than theirs? No. So women are, <laughs> women are responsible for the genetic diversity <laughs> that we have in our species. But, but what is interesting is that when the sweat of women is given to men to smell and talk about what they prefer or what they are attracted to, they can tell a difference between women who are fertile meaning at that point in their menstrual cycle, versus not. And they are more attracted to the smells when they are fertile, which makes sense because basically propagation of the species is dependent on that, right? So men are you know, in, in charge of making more of us, and women are in charge of making sure we're not too similar, <laughs> basically. So there are other interesting um, gender differences when you think about... Um, smell in association with other societal cultural constructs. For example, there's a very interesting study that's been done where they took both men and women and they had them smell the sweat of only women. These women who produced the sweat either produced the sweat when they were in a very stressed environment or given st stressful stimuli or women who were calm and unstressed. Then those men and women were given these odors and they were shown pictures like this, like, like a woman who is busy feeding her kids and also getting them ready for school, something that seems busy or challenging could possibly be a stressful situation. But the faces of the women in the picture are not stressed out. They just are sort of a neutral or happy face. When both men and women were given the odor of a stressed woman, they thought they graded this picture as a stressful situation. When they were given the, the unstressed woman, they, they didn't grade it as particularly stressful. What's more interesting is that men, but not women, also had sort of uh, value judgments on the woman in the picture. They were less capable and they were less trustworthy when they smelled the stressful scent versus the non-stressful scent. So when you take that into the sort of overall global idea of how we interact day to day on a regular basis with each other, you can imagine that you know even if you feel like you have a really cool facade and you're you're not putting on a really nice non-stress, people are taking cues from your own body that you're not aware of and they are not aware of. They are these are subconscious things that are occurring and value judgments are being made about you know not only how stressed you might be, but how capable, how trustworthy, and many other things that studies have shown uh, about a person, just based on how we smell to each other. And then, of course, you know the, the bond between um, the mother and a child is a very sex-specific bond. Uh, women, when given, you know, taken away from their child into a separate environment and, and they're given the pajamas that their babies or their nappies that babies have been sleeping with, all, all mothers are able to identify specifically their own baby's clothing or nappy. Except unless that mother has postpartum depression and then they lose that ability. They, all of the baby pajamas and nappies smell similar. And that you know, is a very interesting, there's, there's so much to talk about olfaction and, and, and what it speaks to about what else is going on in the brain. It's one of the reasons why a lot of people study the olfactory system because it is sometimes a harbinger of other 
neural connectivity and, and issues with that connectivity going on in the brain. And we do know that people who have depression and lots of other neuro, neurodegenerative or, or um, psychiatric issues have decreased or dysfunctional smell. And so it's not surprising, actually, that women with postpartum depression lose that sensitivity to be able to pick out their own baby's smell versus, versus if they are smelling normally. And then finally, I want to just talk a little bit more about gender and societal construct um, because smell is everywhere in our environment and it is actually a huge marketing um, area because, because people know now that we, the, what attracts us to each other is deeper than what we think is going on. It's not just how someone looks to you. It's not just whether they make money or not. It's not just whether you think they're going to be a stable person or not. It really seems to be quite a lot of it predicated on how they smell to you and what that smell makes you feel like. And so billions of dollars are poured into the perfume industry every year to try to figure out, you know, what is it that's going to make that person more attractive to the opposite sex because that's what a lot of people are looking for when they're spending their money. And if you look at the screen, it's pretty easy for me and probably pretty easy for all of you to make out which of these perfumes are female or women perfumes and which of them are men, right? There's a difference in the entire presentation of the smell. We can't smell it at all. And yet we know because of these pinky purple images, because of these rounded shapes of the bottles, that these are supposed to be for women. And that because of those dark, more stark, sharp angles, that those are being marketed for men and they're supposed to be more masculine. And this has been the way that the perfume industry was for years, you know, since people started making perfume back, you know, in, in, in Egyptian times. But what's interesting is more recently, like in the 90s, Calvin Klein came out with this now iconic scent, CK1. And it was really the first time that a mainstream perfume maker uh, marketed a scent that was unisex. You can see it says, a fragrance for a man or for a woman. And you can see everything about their marketing actually speaks to androgyny. These men and women that are in the commercial are all can be a little bit masculine or a little bit feminine. They could be either. And I think that that is encouraging. And we actually now see that as opposed to just in 2010, where the market share for unisex scents and colognes was about 15%. In 2017, the market share for unisex marketed colognes was 72%. So that means that not just is our advertising and marketers and the people making colognes making more of these, but people in general in our society are gravitating more towards these unisex scents. And that may speak to the change, the sea change in our culture where gender fluidity is becoming more acceptable. People don't just think in binary man and woman, you know, male and female, but can appreciate and, and are not sort of afraid to appreciate a guy can choose a scent that has a little rose or vanilla versus just being a musk or a woodsy tone. And so um, I'm going to end with that and, and take any questions. You know, there's, there's a ton of um, other things to speak about, about olfaction in general. None of this is my research. I have no research in gender or sex differences in olfaction. I, I'm, I treat people with olfactory loss, but I'm also a sinus and skull base surgeon. And um, olfactory loss and dysfunction is highly impactful in people's lives. Like Marcia's heard the story of a, a guy who ended up getting divorced because his wife smelled repulsive to him. And there's millions of other stories like that where olfaction is really integral to how we see each other, feel each other, interact with each other. And so just like Dahlia said, I'm happy to to work or collaborate with anyone or just answer questions about anything you're interested in.